Uh, so this is Bayesian deep learning in TensorFlow probability and TensorFlow 2.0, the how and the why, the why and the how. Uh, I, I looked at the, the lectern or the, uh, the schedule outside and it said this is an advanced talk. So I want to, I want to set expectations appropriately. Uh, when I originally wrote this, it's meant for a, uh, like an approachable introduction to what I think can be a very dense, uh, difficult to break into topic that has had some recent innovations in the software space that makes it a, a, a much more ergonomic tool for data scientists to use. And I think the kind folks at ODSC saw what maybe is a hype-filled uh, title and then uh, assume that that's going to go to an advanced audience or, or that you need to have lots of uh, uh, experience with TensorFlow or with probabilistic programming in order to make this work. So just to set all expectations clear, uh, and it appears the attendance hasn't been diminished by that, which I was a little worried about. Uh, but just set expectations clear. This talk is an overview of the layers module of the recently released TensorFlow probability uh, package and its integration into TensorFlow 2.0 Keras, which is a standardized API for TensorFlow 2.0. Uh, it's also an explanation of how to use TFP.layers or TensorFlow probability layers in order to fit distributions over the weights of a neural network uh, and then also an explanation of why you would ever want to do that. This talk is not an introduction to probabilistic programming or Bayesian reasoning or their subtopics in any sort of general fashion. And in the materials, and, and this will be online, uh, there's, there's, I think you guys can't really see that code very well. Uh, in the materials, there will be lots of references about where you could jump in to do that. But this is more a get my hands dirty with using probabilistic programming in deep neural networks in TensorFlow 2.0. Uh, who this talk is for? It's for practitioners. This is not a business talk. I'm not trying to sell you anything. This is for people who want to solve problems with data. Um, and people who are interested in marrying probabilistic techniques so far may have seen somewhat foreign with uh, deep learning frameworks or, but haven't you know, delved in themselves. So why does this matter? Bayesian deep learning, uh, we'll get into many of the advantages, but I think, I think all of us have sort of seen the hype around this. I think it was three years ago at MIPS, and, and there's, a, there's a YouTube video embedded here, there was a panel, and that li the literal title of the panel was, is Bayesian deep learning the most brilliant idea ever? Uh, there's a lot of clear advantages to it. Again, this has been sort of an experts only topic until I would say fairly recently, and so I'm excited to show how everyday data scientists can get their hands dirty. All right, so our dependencies here are going to be TensorFlow 2.0, so the, the latest release of TensorFlow, and uh, TensorFlow Probability, which is a probabilistic programming language. It was originally written for TensorFlow, 2, TensorFlow 1, and uh, I'll give you guys a request to make this bigger. Can you tell me when this is good enough? It's good? Uh, and, and good point, we, uh, unless there are other uh, uh, technical issues, no one can see or hear me. Please let me know that immediately, but otherwise let's save questions until the end. Okay, so starting with TensorFlow 2.0, let's just get our hands, we'll, we'll, we'll jump into tf.keras. That was a typo on my part. Tf. We'll jump into tf.keras and build a really simple regression model. So much of this material comes from TensorFlow 2.0 intro tutorial. The link is here. Um, and we'll use the empty cars data set. If everyone's familiar with empty cars, it's kind of a hello world of regression problems. So we will load it up. And here are imports. We'll get the data file. I've already downloaded this one, so it's really fast. We'll name all of our columns and then take a look at it. So we've got miles per gallon, cylinders, displacement, horsepower, weight, acceleration, the model year, and then origin, that's a, a categorical variable that we'll need to, to transform. The objective here is we wanna use these features here to predict this output variable, the miles per gallon. So we'll clean it up, drop our NA values, pop off the origin column. Yeah, that's uh, this categorical one that has US, Europe, and Japan. We'll cast it to a float make that categorical, and now we've got a one-hot encoder, USA, Europe, and Japan. And we will use some nice pandas functionality to split this into an 80-20 train test division. So now we can start exploring this data. Uh, Seaborn, the pair plot, is a really nice visualization library. I'm, I'm sure many people are familiar with it. If, if you're not, uh, jump in. It's, it's built on top of matplotlib. And we're going to pair plot this with a kernel density estimator on the, uh, on the diagonal. So we can see sort of how these variables relate to each other. So we've got miles per gallon on the, uh, we've got each, each variable on the y-axis and the x-axis. Each point here, we can see how they relate to one another. On the diagonal, sort of a kernel estimate, uh, a smoothing function over the points observed for that variable itself. 
So let's pop off the miles per gallon. We'll turn this into our training, uh, our training data set and do some descriptive stats on that. So we can see our uh, standard deviation min, our, our intermediate percentiles, and our max. This all looks good. And now we'll do a normal transformation in order to feed this into an, um, a regression network. So a common question people have when you're first seeing a regression problem, a regression neural network, is why are you doing the steps that you're doing? Uh, you want to do a normal transform when you're bringing in data to a regression network for broadly two reasons. Uh, first, it's going to ensure that your input features are commensurate with one another. So the variance between one thing and the other thing are, are equal. You don't have something, maybe your height is measured in inches, and that has a lot of variance, which has an undue effect on your network's variance, your network's predictions. Uh, and then two, this is kind of a slightly less important thing, uh, it ensures that the, the input to your network has a, has a variation of both positive and negative inputs. Uh, and that's going to give your network some flexibility reasons for your, depending on the activation function you use. In this case, uh, we'll use ReLU, where it's going to actually be different if it's a negative or positive input. So it's good to balance those. Uh, for more detail, I would recommend this blog post, which should load up quickly. Yeah. So we can define a, a normal transformation function where we will take in some data frame, uh, subtract the mean of each variable, and then divide by the standard deviation. And note here, we're going to do that for both. We're going to use the train stats for both the, uh, the train data and the test data. So we're not going to know anything about the test data before it comes in. We're going to assume it comes with the same distribution as the training data. And now we can jump in. So we, have, we define this function which builds a Keras model. This is tof.keras, not standard Keras. So you want to be, uh, be sure that you're using TensorFlow 2.0 Keras. Uh, we're going to use a sequential API, which lets us just define a list of what are called layers. So this is TensorFlow Keras layers, which we imported at the top. We'll define a three-layer neural network. It's got, they're all just vanilla, basic, uh, densely connected layers using a ReLU activation function, and then we have an input shape that we define based on the length of our training data set. Uh, we'll also define an optimizer. In this case, we'll use RMS prop. Generally, I like to use Atom, but it's good to, uh, to see uh, the variance of uh, different, different optimization techniques that are available within this module. Uh, and then we need to define the model, and, and that's, we use a compile. So we'll say what loss function we want to use. We use mean squared error. We'll use our optimizer, and then we have these metrics. There's just handy things that are going to be tracked in our validation set as the model trains. So we can execute this cell. Uh, that's just a function. We can build our model, and now we've got uh, a summary. So we can, we can look at this and look at the, uh, the shape and the number of parameters available for each layer. Each layer has a name. They're all dense. Go dense, dense one, dense two. And we see we've got 4,865 parameters. Uh, there's the power of, of deep learning. You've got many more parameters than you have input observations. So uh, we'll see how that can have some negative side effects. Uh, so yeah, almost 5,000 parameters here for just 314 uh, input observations in our trained data. Let's give it a shot. We'll pass an example batch through our network. Uh, these are just the first 10 observations, and we, we're predicting the miles per gallon. These look pretty random. Uh, but just for good measure, let's give it a shot again. And we get the same result both times. That seems obvious. You define a network once, you don't train it, you pass two observations, you pass observations through it twice, you get the same results both times. Uh, but I wanted to point that out for completion's sake. We come back around and do this probabilistically. Uh, now, what happens if we train a new model and predict on these same records? Uh, so we're predicting on that same example batch with a new model, and we see that its predictions are actually different from what we got just before. Uh, that's because all the weights are being initialized randomly. And so uh, there's really no bearing between these two models. They're completely random. They're not even correlated. Uh, so let's train these networks up. So we'll define a, a helper class here, a, a Keras callback. And what this is going to do is at, on every, at the end of every epoch, at the end of every epoch that we train, we'll print out a dot. And at the end of 100 epochs, we'll print a new line. Uh, we'll train for 1,000 epochs. Uh, we'll have a validation split of 80-20. And we'll call in our, uh, our print.callback. And this should take maybe 10 seconds. All right. And we, we printed out the, uh, the results of our model that fit to this history object. So we can take a look at this. Uh, history is a callbacks.history object. We can 
use the, uh, the built-ins in Python and see what's available on that. There's a lot of little helper methods, uh, but we can access the history.history .history dictionary, turn that into a pandas data frame, and take a look at what were the results of, of each of our epics on our, uh, our loss, and then all the metrics that we defined for both the, uh, the training and the validation sets. So let's assign that index directly and then plot the results of our uh, the results of our training on both the uh, the train error and the validation error across both uh, mean absolute error and means squared error. So that'd be how far are we off in miles per gallon squared. And we can see that uh, even though we continue to include in, improve throughout all thousand epochs, our validation error uh, didn't do as well. Where we, we had substantially higher validation error than train error, and that's true across across both metrics. So that's not good. That's, uh, that's a classic example of overfitting. I'm sure everyone here is familiar with overfitting, but that means we've, we've overcommitted to features that we've observed in the training data set that don't generalize to our validation or our test data set. This is due to the size of our model versus the size of our input data, and then uh, relatively trivial differences between the two. Uh, what happens if we predict on our example batch again? So now we, get what we suspect are much more reasonable values. So 37, 12, 23, these look like things that could be miles per gallon um, miles per gallon values for gas efficiency in cars. And if we predict again, we get the same results again. I know that seems obvious, but we'll come back to it. And well, how, how does that compare to the complete untrained model? Obviously much better. Now, what if we trained that network? So we're taking model two, which is defined the same way as model one. Uh, both have random initialization. They're both gonna train for a thousand eight box. And let's see uh, how model two does on the same, on the same prediction set. Okay, so here we can see model one's prediction on the left, model two's prediction on the right for each of the first 10 um, input observations. And although they're very close, they're never exactly the same. So what that tells us, we can, we can actually calculate the exact difference between the two, is that that random initialization that we're doing for the network weights has an impact on the, net, on the outputs of the network even after we change for a thousand epochs twice. Uh, that should give us pause because the network's not being transparent about which one is right, which one does it think is more likely. Uh, it's simply checking, choosing a random value, uh, choosing a series of random values for its additional weights, adjusting those weights using gradient descent, and then making predictions that it thinks are reasonable. Um, but we don't have any way to, to judge the stability of these. And in fact, some of these are varying much more than others. So we got one that's all, almost off by, what, two miles per gallon here. Uh, Keras has some nice, nice, uh, convenience functions. So there's one for early stopping, which will help us address this overfitting problem. We see here that even though we, we train for a thousand epochs, maybe a hundred uh, actually have an impact on the validation error. So we can just tell Keras to look out for that and, uh, and stop whenever it stops seeing improvement in, the, in that validation error. So let's check that out. We'll train, let's see, we got through less than a hundred, less than 50 epochs here. And then we said, well, we have a tolerance of exactly 10 epochs of no improvement in the validation error, and then we, we killed it. Uh, so we'll try that again on the second model. So that's interesting. Uh, the second model actually took more epochs than the first model. Again, this is due to the randomization error. So, so we can see that, that uh, this early stopping parameter and the, uh, the randomization of the network weights have different effects. So it took 60, 66 epochs for the second one, 47 for the first one, and we're still getting substantial errors between the two. Uh, we, can, we can check out on our test set the mean absolute error for model one and for model two, and in fact, that's almost a 10% difference between the two. Uh, so let's plot our predictions. Um, we have our predictions on the y-axis and the, the true values on the x-axis, so an exactly correct prediction would, would fall right on this line that we have as a, as a helper. We can do that between the two and see, although these are very similar, uh, they're not identical. So we're making different predictions and we have different errors for each one of these, these input points. And we can plot those. And so, yeah, so these look like they might be normal subject to some sort of, uh, some sort of sampling. We don't have too many observations, but uh, certainly, certainly not, not as normal as we'd, we'd hope our errors to be in our regression model. 
Uh, if we combine those two, we can see we get a little bit more of a normal distribution of our errors, which that's the central limit theorem at work. And I'm mean, sure everyone's familiar, but there's a central limit theorem if anyone's interested to follow up. Uh, so a couple takeaways here. Neural networks are subject to uncertainty in their weights due to the random nature of their initialization in the selection of training and validation data. This can lead to different weight selections and repeated applications of the same training routine. And this property is present even when we employ tricks like early stopping to control for that overfitting. So now that we've done this, uh, that was so easy, we can do it again. But we're going to take a little bit different approach to our network definition. So we'll go through the same sort of like data acquisition and cleaning steps. And now we're going to replace the dense layer that we had previously with uh, this TFP, that's tensorflow probabilities dot layers dot dense variational. Um, we're going to keep all the same. Um, we're going to keep all the same arguments, the same activation arguments here, and the rest of the network stays completely identical, and it is just that easy. So what is dense variational? It's a vanilla densely connected neural network that rather than fitting point estimates for all of its weights, uh, instead fits distributions to the, from which its weights get drawn on every time the network has a forward pass. So rather than trying to learn, well, the, the estimate for this weight is x. We're saying the estimate for this weight is a distribution defined by standard deviation and mean x and y. And then every time we run through this model, we're going to sample from that distribution because we actually can't be certain what the exact value for x is. And that's giving us full support for uncertainty in the model. Uh, so let's, uh, and, and another link here on, on what variational inferences, that's the exact uh, Bayesian inference technique that's being used under the hoods here. Uh, it's beyond the scope of this talk to get into how exactly variational inference works or what its application is, but for right now, just know that it's a, it's a more computationally efficient way to do Bayesian inference than, say, Markov chain Monte Carlo. Uh, so let's build this model. And we are immediately met by an error. So it's not, it's not exactly that easy. It doesn't exactly match the, uh, the uh, input signature of the dense layer. So we have to do a little bit of work here. We're going to specify trainable priors and posterior functions for this dense variational. We have to tell the, uh, the network what, what sort of distribution are we going to draw these weights from. So we have to define a, uh, a make, make posterior, which is going to take a kernel size, a bias size, and a data type, return a callable that creates a, a TensorFlow distributions or TensorFlow probability distributions instance. Uh, and in our case, it's going to execute mean field approximation for variational inference. Again, me, the mechanics of mean field uh, approximation and, and as it relates to um, as it relates to variational inference are a little bit beyond the scope of this talk. But there's a link if anyone's interested to pursue further. So we're going to define this posterior mean field. Um, all of the signatures have to be the same. So we have to have, take a kernel size, a bias size, and a data type. And we're going to return out of this a, uh, a Keras sequential model that takes a trainable variable layer. This is coming, again, from tfp.layers. And then this, this special distribution lambda, which will take in the output of some layer. And this one's only outputting one value. And it's going to fit a normal distribution to, using the mean and the standard deviation according to that value t. Okay, so we make that. And we also need to define a prior distribution. So this posterior is how we're going to take the outputs of, uh, of our variational inference and turn it into a distribution that we can, we can draw samples from. And this prior is going to say, well, what does the initial distribution on those weights look like? So we won't play, in our case, We'll, we'll have a normal distribution with a trainable mean. So that is, we won't place any expectations on the mean of our prior in the normal distribution, and we'll define our, uh, our scale, our standard deviation, to be exactly one. And now that we've defined these guys, we can pass them in as new arguments to the dense variational layer. And our model builds successfully. We've replaced our dense layer with dense variational, and we see it's got 1,920 parameters. Uh, as a reminder, the last model we just trained, the vanilla dense layer had only 640 parameters. So we're actually training three times as many parameters in this case as we before. This is due to the, uh, the additional parameters, the mean, the standard deviation on those priors. So let's try our previous exercise of just predicting an example batch straight through. Uh, and we, if we do it again, so we just took the, the first 10 records from the norm trained data, predicted through. If we do it again, we should get the same results. 
Uh, so here's the trick. We didn't get the same results. Even on our untrained network, we are now getting substantially different results when we pass the same data through the same network. And again, that's because rather than just, just having a, a network which has weights and biases that, that has matrix multiplication with our input, uh, each of those weights and biases is being drawn from a random distribution, which right now is untrained. So you can actually see tremendous variation in what we're predicting. Uh, we can even inspect uh, each of these layers directly and access them like this. Uh, okay, so the first layer is dense variational. Uh, what's happening here is the model isn't learning weights for that, that layer. It hasn't initialized them. It's just learning distributions. And so it's completely untrained right now. So we'll use the exact same training inference that we used before uh, to train it up. And I, I want to stress that it was the exact, the only thing that changed from this model to the previous model was this layer. Everything else is exactly identical down to the loss function. Okay. So now we can look at our, uh, look at our model. These, this is again plotting the, uh, or checking out the loss, the, the, the mean absolute error and the mean squared error across both the training and the validation sets. And these values are actually a little bit higher than they were before. So our model didn't quite learn as much. It's because it has more parameters, it takes longer to train. But I want to point out that the mean absolute error in, the, in the, the training set and in the validation set are extremely comparable. These are very close. So in fact, if we plot this, we can see, well, using the same plot, it's actually not very helpful because our, our orange, our validation error, and our train error are right on top of each other. So let's increase the, uh, the transparency on that. And we can see that over all thousand epochs, our, uh, our model didn't start to overfit. So there's, there's almost zero gap between the, uh, the training, training set error and the validation set error. So uh, that's fascinating. We could do test predictions and see, uh, well, you see, again, we're a little bit further away from from the true values we were predicting before. So our, our network isn't as strictly accurate, but it's still learning. We could continue to train it. And if we do that again, notice we get, we get non-equivalent samples passing the same data through this network. Uh, so let's start taking a look at those predictions. Uh, we'll define this y hat using list comprehension. We're going to predict over this, this model, or over this, this test data, a hundred times. So now I've got a hundred predictions, each taking random samples from the, the input distributions over the network weights, and we're going to check out what that looks like. So on the head of this, we've got a hundred predictions along the, the columns here. Uh, each of these represents a random draw from the weight, and we can, we can estimate the uncertainty in the, in the model by the variance in each one of these, these records. So let's go ahead and do that. So here we've got our, uh, for, for each input prediction, we've got the uh, prediction from one of the estimates from the model and then the true value. And we're going to plot those. Uh, that's kind of ugly because we've, again, got, got full transparency, or we've got no transparency enabled, so we can <coughs> increase that. And we can see these kind of, kind of blurs, which are the model telling us, well, I think that for, for example, uh, the values that I'm, that I'm predicting that are supposed to be you know, 45 take this kind of a range. They can go anywhere in here. And this is a monotonic sequence, so there's really no duplicate values here. Uh, that's the model being transparent with us about what's the, what's the uncertainty that it has in its output. Whereas before, that, that uncertainty was masked from us because we're just taking a single draw. This randomization is just saying, well, you know, I, I had a random walk and I landed here, and that's what I think. Uh, this, t this idea of uncertainty is very, is very powerful. And in fact, so if we run test predictions through here, again, this is just running exactly one uh, test prediction and doing one draw from each of the networks. And it looks about like the earlier, um, earlier prediction errors did. And this time, well, if we do it again, we get something different. But rather than doing that, we can instead just sample many, many times and see that and see that we actually do get this normal distribution. So here we're looking at our 100 predictions, and we can sample as many times as we want and see that this, this error uh, estimate gets closer and closer and closer to a true normal. And additionally, we can continue to train this model. So let's give it now 2,000 more epochs and see if we start to overfit. Yeah. 
yeah, you could do really funny things with these, uh, these uh, callbacks. So on every epoch, you could print a smiley face or an emoji or any, any integer multiple of epochs. So you can start to spell out words based on the number of, uh, number of epochs that you've already trained. Uh, this should take maybe five more seconds. All right. So now we've got our uh, second hist, and because yeah, our, our hist2 uh, was just a continuation of the original one, we combine those two together in a single data frame, plot the history, and we see even though our training rate slowed down, after 3,000 epochs, we're, we're still not starting to overfit uh, in either mean absolute error or mean square. And if we plot these guys, we see roughly the same distribution. So this is about as certain as our model can get. And we've got this normal distribution. Well, actually, maybe a little bit skewed of, uh, of errors. So you can see we've got a couple values uh, in the negative 15 range that maybe extend beyond here. Uh, so takeaways, TensorFlow probability offers a layer submodule with a selection of uh, Keras compatible or TensorFlow 2.0 Keras compatible neural network layers that are fully probabilistic. They interoperate cleanly with the existing neural network architectures uh, up to a point, so you know, sometimes they need uh, a few extra input arguments, but, but up to a point, they've got the same interface. Uh, probabilistic neural networks are substantially less prone to overfitting the neural networks that merely fit point estimates. Uh, and the predict method on these models pulls a random draw from the distributions that specify the weights of the model. Uh, if we run many predictions, we can draw a Monte Carlo sample from the model and obtain true estimates of its uncertainty. Uh, the point on probabilistic neural networks being less prone to overfitting is a good one, and that's been explored theoretically in some depth in academic uh, publications. Again, beyond the scope of this talk, but I would refer anyone who's interested to Gal and Garamani from 2016, where they actually wrote a paper about how dropout, you know, the typical regularization technique, is an approxim is a Bayesian approximation. So using Bayesian approximation over the weights of a neural network is functionally equivalent to employing dropout on that network, which of course we didn't before. So we got those, those overfitting benefits. All right. Uh, let's jump a little bit more a little bit more ankle deep into uh, regression with probabilistic layers. So this material is adapted from a, uh, a blog post by the TensorFlow probability team. Uh, so references here, I, I think it's really worth walking through to get a feel for what TensorFlow probability offers, what sort of range of, uh, range of modules is. So we'll import everything here. And we've seen how to solve regression problems. Now let's take it into probability land. So we're going to start out defining just a regular lambda uh, to be the negative log likelihood. I assume most people here are familiar with what negative log likelihood is, but we'll explore it in some depth because it's worth understanding. Uh, here, it means the likelihood that a given random observation occurs for some expected distribution of random observations. And then we log that and we make it negative. So we have a lambda function that takes two inputs, uh, a y and a random variable that's supposed to model the y. And we take that random distribution well, we call the log prob method on it, on y, and then we take the negative of that. Uh, but before trusting me, let's, let's work this through from first principles. So if we take log of the range of you know, 0 0.01, 0 0.5, 0 0.91, and 1.5, then we can see that that's a strictly monotonically increasing uh, function for input numbers greater than zero. And we also know that the log of values that are less than one is always going to be negative. So, probabilities that we'll encounter are, are strictly always going to be, you know, 